Good morning to all those of you who are joining us here in our Falk Auditorium at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. And hello to the many who are joining us virtually online from around the world. I'm Suzanne Maloney. I'm Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy here at the Brookings Institution. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event on America's maritime role and the changing global landscape. This is one of the first events in our new speaker series, The Seas and Strategy, and part of a growing body of Brookings work on maritime issues and naval power. America has been a maritime nation since its earliest days. And to this day, every part of American society is shaped by dynamics at sea, from the flow of goods on the vast container ships that symbolize modern globalization, to oceanographic sciences that help us understand our changing climate, to American naval power, which is the bedrock of our power projection around the globe. Of course, America is far from the only nation dependent on sea-based flows. So are our allies and partners, and so are many other countries, including China. As we all learned in jarring ways over the past few years, markets are hugely dependent on the safe movements of good by, goods by sea, whether that's grain shipped from Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea, or fuel shipped through the Suez Canal, or commercial goods flowing through the Taiwan Strait. But as tensions between the world's top economic and military powers rise, new questions loom about the implications for commercial and scientific cooperation to say nothing of mounting naval tensions. Our panel today is here to discuss these complex issues and the stakes at sea today. Before I turn it over to our moderator and our distinguished guests, please allow me to offer some brief introductions. Admiral Michael Gilday has served as the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations since 2019. Throughout his career, he has commanded cruisers, aircraft carriers, and destroyer Squadron 7. Admiral Gilday has also assumed significant joint leadership roles, notably serving as the Director of Operations for NATO's Joint Force Command in Lisbon and the Chief of Staff for Naval Striking and Support Forces, NATO. Prior to his appointment as CNO, he most recently served as Director of the Joint Staff. Dr. Margaret Leinen is the director of the Distinguished Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Very distinguished and very complex. She also serves as UCSD's Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences and is the Dean of the School of Marine Sciences. She leads innovative research that addresses the critical environmental challenges that face our planet. Prior to her current role, Dr. Leinen was at the National Science Foundation where she led vital programs in marine, atmospheric, and earth sciences. Peter Levesque is the president and CEO of CMA CGM North America, one of the world's largest container shipping companies, as well as CEO of American President Lines. With over 30 years of international transportation experience, Peter has held several executive positions, including president of Ports at Ports America Group, the largest terminal operating company, in the United States and the Chief Executive Officer of Modern Terminals Limited. And finally, our moderator for our discussion today, my colleague in the Foreign Policy Program here at Brookings, Bruce Jones is a Senior Fellow in the Strobe Talbot Center for Security Strategy and Technology. An expert in U.S. strategy and international security, Bruce's most recent work, To Rule the Waves, which you can purchase if you're in the back, if you, in the back of our uh, auditorium here today or on any online retailer, To Rule the Waves navigates the complexities of global commerce against the backdrop of mounting naval tensions. Before I begin, let me note that we are live streaming and on the record. For those who are joining us virtually, please send your questions to events at brookings.edu or using the hashtag US Maritime on Twitter. For those in the audience, we will be passing mics during the question and answer session toward the end of our session here today. Bruce, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, Admiral, Dr. Leinen, Peter. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to have you all on stage with us today. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Suzanne highlighted some of the issues that are consequential for the United States, for the world of the maritime sector. From your vantage point, what are the stakes at sea? Admiral. So I'll begin with uh, my bumper sticker would be that the global economy floats on seawater. And so assuring um, uh, open access uh, to sea lanes, ensuring that they're secure and available for all uh, to operate under, on, and above the sea is critically important to achieving that main thing, which is uh, uh, economic prosperity for all. 
70% of the countries in the world touch the oceans. And so we're all dependent, uh, very much dependent on, um, on, um, on the sea lanes uh, to maintain our uh, strong, strong economy, strong, strong trade. Uh, and so the U.S. Navy, uh, since Bretton Woods for the last uh, almost 80 years, has been forward, uh, and we have to be forward uh, to ensure that those sea lanes remain open, working by, with, and through our allies and partners. We're not doing this alone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we all benefit from this. And so uh, for me, that is uh, first and foremost uh, why the Navy needs to be forward and why it's important that, uh, that we be out there always. Peter, that's a good introduction to you from your vantage point. Yeah, Bruce, thank you. Uh, I think unlike the Navy, uh, very much uh, the U.S. is no longer uh, a leader in maritime trade. Uh, we lost that about two decades ago with the sale of APL to Singapore and the sale of Sealand to Maersk. Uh, so today, here we are in the United States with a $23 trillion economy that is very much dependent on our relationships and the services of foreign flag carriers like CMA. Uh, so today in the maritime industry for container ships, the, these big container ships, U.S., we don't build them, we don't own them, and we don't sail on them but we're very much dependent on the U.S. economy that these relationships work, and they do work today, uh, thanks to the Navy and their security and, and helping us to uh, have that kind of security in these sea trade lanes. I will say, too, that uh, even though these carriers, like CMA, are foreign flag, we also, in CMA's case, we own APL, which is a U.S. flag division of CMA. So we do provide uh, services to the U.S. military, to U.S. aid, uh, and for U.S. impelled cargo. Uh, Maersk does the same uh, through the Maritime Security Program, and Hapag Lloyd in Germany does the same. So the dynamics are interesting. Um, and as we look at the supply chain of the United States and who the players are, uh, where it used to be very much U.S., today we rely on relationships from around the world. Uh, we were talking backstage right now. Of course, people are watching in the news the, the worker strike at Long Beach. We saw a couple of years ago huge delays in cargo ships at Long Beach. Long Beach last year, I think, did 9 million container drops. Shanghai did 60 million 60 last million. year. Yeah. And it's only one of five Chinese forts in the top 10. It gives you a sense of the scale of Chinese dominance of the, of the commercial trade. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, China owns or operates 90 ports in 53 countries today. We'll come back to that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Margaret, from your perspective. So uh, we've heard the emphasis on global trade and, and how tightly that is linked to security. But there are a couple of other pieces uh, that are related to the ocean that are incredibly important for, for us and for the world. The first is that climate change is joined at the hip to the ocean. The ocean is the flywheel of climate. About 25% of the CO2 that's emitted winds up in the ocean, but 93% of the heat generated as a result of those greenhouse gases winds up in the ocean. So if you think about the changes that we're seeing in temperature and warming on land, the ocean is protecting us from 93% of the impact of that. It's just incredibly important for us to understand uh, exactly how that works. And we didn't, we didn't even know that number until about 15 years ago. So, uh, and then the relationship between the ocean and the atmosphere is the basis of the whole water cycle, precipitation. Everything that you see with atmospheric rivers on the West Coast. People didn't even know that term until about five years ago. Uh, it, and and uh, flood and drought are just integrally tied to the ocean. The second thing is food. We don't think about that too much in the US, but two billion people on the planet depend on seafood protein for their, their protein. And that means that there is a great, and you, you hear all the time about the, uh, the overfishing. So that represents a potential an incredible disruption 
you know, if we uh, if we see that food that food supply uh, becoming insecure. Uh, another thing that uh, people don't understand is the very strong relationship between human health and the ocean. So, uh, all over in Southeast Asia uh, and parts of uh, Latin America and South America, cholera is a major uh, problem. Cholera is the the virus that causes uh, cholera is uh, transmitted through uh, plankton, a microscopic ocean organism. Uh, uh, zooplankton, and that transfer link is an ocean link between what's happening uh, in the ocean and cholera outbreaks. Uh, on the other side, uh, the ocean is one of the foremost uh, sources of potential drugs. Organisms make toxins to prevent themselves from being attacked, eaten, etc., and those toxins are the, you know, some of the primary compounds that are associated with drugs. So right now, uh, there are, are uh, uh, several antibiotics, which would be the first antibiotics uh, um, approved in almost 25 years. Uh, that we have a, uh, uh, a drug in third stage clinical trials for glioblastoma, the, uh, the cancer that took John McCain and, uh, and uh, uh, Bo, Bo Biden, and for which there has been no drug. So it, it's a, an incredible source of resources in that sense as well. And then we're talking about all kinds of uses of the maritime environment for wind power, mm -hmm. uh, for um, uh, kinetic uh, energy from currents, uh, from uh, offshore uh, installations for aquaculture and, and so forth. So I'll talk more about the security link, but these are all pieces that are integrally tied yeah. to our economic security. I'll add one, which I think there's a kind of growing awareness of, but only recently, which is that we live in a data-driven world. Everything we do, smartphones, Zoom meetings, et cetera, 93% of all data is carried on undersea cables, yes. which I have to say I think of as globalization's most important and most fragile network. Um, I want to ask you each starting with you, Peter, and Wook, and with you, uh, what you see as the major challenge in front of you in your sector? The major challenge for us is, is obviously uh, what happens uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, Five trillion dollars of goods flow through the South China Sea every year. Uh, it's, it's a major shipping lane, obviously, for, for CMA and, and for the other carriers. We're worried about what everybody's worried about, that two planes go bump in the night or two ships go bump in the night accidentally and spiral into something bigger. And all of a sudden, uh, we can't use those trade lanes or insurance companies won't insure our ships to go through those trade lanes. Uh, it's a real concern. And, and I, think, uh, I don't think we fully comprehend how big of an impact that would be, not only the global supply chain, but to the US supply chain in particular if tensions get to the point where, where that's an unusual, unusable space. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the Admiral's going to comment on that, but Margaret, let me let you go first, and then we'll... Sure. Uh, so Peter talked about the, the change in the dominance in, uh, uh, in marine transport. We are at a cusp in marine science. 20 years ago, um, although there were lots of players, the U.S. was, you know, absolutely dominant in marine science. Uh, two things are disrupting that. The first is the funding for science by the European Union in addition to the funding of individual nations. So Europe as a whole has gone together and has a whole cascade of very large projects, uh, 25 to $50 million a year projects. That are, uh, that are marine ocean science oriented. And then there's China. And the growth of uh, marine science in China is staggering. Uh, just in the last 10 years, we have seen them invest in whole new oceanographic institutions, each of which are as big as uh, Scripps or Woods Hole. Uh, and they have just been constructed of whole cloth. Uh, there, and uh, I, I brought this with me so I can get the names of the initiatives uh, straight. But uh, since 
uh, about 2005, uh, China has had medium to long-term science and development plans, MLPs, uh, which prioritize mega projects. Every single one of those has had at least one marine mega project. And they're, they're not uniform across all of science, uh, but there have always been uh, marine mega projects, sometimes more than one. Uh, early on, it was focused on infrastructure, uh, so it was observations. Uh, certainly satellite, but major ocean observations. Then in the medium term, it was shipbuilding. So there were, uh, there, they uh, had a National Engineering Research Center um, initiative. Three of those centers were built, were around ship design, shipbuilding, and ship navigation. And that resulted in just a, a burst of, of construction every one of the new oceanographic institutions, as well as two new ocean universities that, that were just constructed of whole cloth since 2010, have a research vessel that is larger than any US ocean research vessel that has benefited from this, this kind of construction. Uh, and the latest uh, mega project is called deep sea stations, and uh, there's not a lot of, uh, of information on exactly what China considers a deep sea station, but you can, you can understand the, the uh, strategic uh, importance of being able to have, something, have a nexus of capabilities that is uh, in the deep ocean. And so the big challenge for us is not the intellectual ability, but the sheer financial uh, tidal wave of funding elsewhere that we're trying that we're up against. Admiral, I think a common uh, theme here so far in the discussion has been a growth in the reliance in the maritime commons, and we see that increasing. We talk about the Internet of Things, and now we're talking about the Ocean of Things. Uh, examples would be a hundred percent increase in. Uh, offshore wind energy uh, by uh, by 2030, an increasingly reliance on uh, oil exploration uh, further from shore in uh, in deeper waters. That trend is increasing. Uh, we talked about climate change. The trade routes between Asia and Europe will fundamentally change in our lifetime uh, due to the uh, erosion of the, the polar ice cap. Uh, and so the Arctic becomes now an area of competition that we must think more deeply about. So I go back to the, to the point that I made up front about the rules-based international order, how that serves uh, service global, not just the United States, obviously, uh, but it's been a tide that's lifted all boats uh, 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 in, in many different ways uh, I term, in, in terms of, I think it's contributed to the reduction of global poverty. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's increased the amount of information that, that flows uh, uh, across across the globe, and so there's been so many benefits. So I think for the Navy and our partners, and I spend a, an awful lot of time with my allies and partners, uh, with allies and partners, just met with all the European chiefs of Navy uh, two weeks ago uh, to talk about common challenges and opportunities. Um, we continue to work together, um, and I think part of that is to show those that would like to challenge the rule-based international order that, uh, that it's unacceptable, and perhaps enticing them to join the rest of us in following the rules uh, that, we, that we currently all abide by. I'm going to draw you out on a couple of those points, if I could. Um, first, the Arctic. Uh, you were just in London for the first Sea Lords conference, and one of the things you did there was call for a large fleet exercise <laughs> uh, in the northern waters. Uh, just say a word about what was behind your thinking there. So... Um, the parallel I would draw is to the Rim of Pacific exercise or Rim Pack that we do every other year in the Pacific that involves about 30, diff 30 navies and tens of thousands of sailors. It's, a, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a catastrophically successful uh, <laughs> venture uh, for, for navies. And they're not just from the Asia Pacific. They're from all over the globe that join us for that exercise. 
Uh, and I think that we could do the same up in the Arctic. And it doesn't have to be led by the United States. The United States can be part of it. Remember, eight, you know, now with Sweden, uh, uh, hopefully uh, Sweden and, and Finland uh, joining NATO, eight of the nine nations of the Arctic Council are actually um, part of NATO. And so um, I think that that's a force here. And I think that as we talk about, we talk about NATO, we usually frame it uh, thinking about a tra the transatlantic relationship. And I think that over time, we'll begin to talk more and more about the transpolar uh, nature and interest involved there. Are you keeping a close eye on transpolar routes? Uh, it's something that, obviously, anything, any trade routes that open up, they're going to allow us to move product from the manufacturer to the store shelf faster uh, is something that we're interested in. We don't have a plan today on that, but we are watching it. And, Margaret, you have researchers in the Arctic. You have participated in international okay. scientific collaboration in the Arctic. How, how important is developments in the Arctic in your vantage point? They're, they're incredibly important. Uh, not only are the polar regions changing faster than any part of the, any other part of the planet, but what starts in the Arctic or happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, it affects the general circulation of the ocean and so forth. And one of the, the key things is that um, this change in the Arctic is going to be something that hasn't happened in millions of years. And we aren't really tracking it the way that we should be. Uh, uh, m climate modelers uh, are sort of in two camps about the Arctic. One of them says, yes, summer will be ice-free uh, across the entire Arctic. Others say that there are feedback loops that certainly will thin the ice, but it'll never be completely ice-free. The fact that we don't know that when everybody is thinking about how to exploit the Arctic is that's a strategic weakness. Admiral, you didn't use the word, but China looms large in this conversation in terms of the pace of the commercial development over the last 20 years, the explosion of scientific research in the last several years, and probably the fastest naval buildup of any country since we did it after Pearl Harbor. Uh, I suspect you spent a lot of your nights thinking about China. You have Chinese ships cutting across American frigates and destroyers on a, on a semi-weekly basis. How... Uh, to what extent does China's naval buildup drive your sense of the challenges that we face? Uh, the lack of transparency is concerning their intentions respect to how, they're, how they intend to use their Navy uh, to reach uh, President Xi's goals uh, are concerning with respect to military expansion. Uh, that said, I go back to allies and partners are increasing reliance on those relationships. It's not a single thing we do out there on the oceans every day, and we have 100 ships at sea third of the fleet out there at any given day that we're not doing without, uh, uh, without, uh, without uh, allies and partners uh, being involved. When I think about, uh, uh, in terms of being a, a bit of an optimist, and if I take a look at what we've done with a large number of nations to combat piracy in the Gulf of Aden and off of, uh, off of the coast of uh, East Africa, the Chinese have been involved in that. Uh, and they've been good partners with respect to um, combating piracy, thwarting it, uh, and keeping those sea lanes uh, open and accessible for all. So that should be a model, I think, uh, for the behavior that we should expect uh, from, the, from, uh, from the PRC. And uh, I would encourage more of that type, type of collaborative, those types of collaborative operations at sea that benefit all of us. Um, you have to, of course, plan for contingencies that are less positive than that. Peter, you talked about the potential for contingency at Taiwan Strait. You have ships that sail in those waters doing research. How worried are you about the, uh, the risk of a crisis, the risk of disruption? I mean, this would be a pretty dramatic event if we were to end up in a, a full-blown naval clash in the Western Pacific. But how worried are you about those kinds of scenarios? I am encouraged by the most recent turn in dialogue by senior leaders, um, uh, with respect to toning down the, uh, I would say, militaristic tone, um, I think that's been helpful. Um, I think that we need to continue to operate out there, and we need to continue to operate forward. Uh, we need to assure allies and partners. And at the same time, we need to deter any, anybody, any nation that intends to um, challenge those international rules, challenge the security interests of not only the United States, but our 
allies and partners and put our economic interests uh, in jeopardy. And so I think we need to be out there and we need to be in the way. Um, we can't just be uh, milling about. It has to be purposeful uh, and, and, and it has to be non-provocative. Let me, let me just underscore that. Um, we had a destroyer that went through the uh, Taiwan Strait along with the Canadian ship uh, this past weekend. We were challenged by the Chinese. What you are seeing in those interactions, and I'm very proud of not only the commanding officers of the ships that go uh, nose to nose with the PRC and the Russians, but also uh, our air crews in the air that are experiencing the same type of, at times, aggressive behavior. Uh, and so we're handling that, I think, uh, very well, very professionally. And remember those mill-to-mill -mill relationships that we have across the globe with our fellow uh, militaries, those are intended to be a, uh, a shock absorber. And so no matter the political climate, uh, those mill-to-mill -mill relationships have to be steady, predictable, uh, and they have to be uh, very measured. And so that's what, we, um, that's, that's what we're focused on. Uh, at this stage, what I want to do is bring in some questions that came from. We have several hundred people listening online, and some of them sent questions in advance. And I had other questions, but I'm going to kind of fuse mine with theirs. And, and one of them, I was going to put this negatively. Uh, Isaac Carden, who's at Carnegie, wrote in a, a, a positive version of this question. I was going to ask, I'm worried that in the American polity, in the American debate, there isn't an adequate attention to the issues that you all are, are talking about, an adequate attention to the stakes we have at sea. Isaac put it more positively to ask you, what is it that federal, state, local governments, private sector actors can do to raise awareness of how much uh, is at stake in this country and internationally in the sectors that you work? Peter, why don't I start with you? Well, I think the, uh, the event that kind of brought everybody into the supply chain world was COVID. Uh, a lot of people really didn't understand how things got to the store shelf uh, until COVID hit and the congestion hit and we had 150 ships off of LA Long Beach uh, and, and what that all meant uh, in terms of uh, gumming up the, the global supply chain and the US supply chain. So in a weird way, uh, the conversations that we have today on the Hill and everywhere else uh, are, are a lot easier because people have taken the time to understand whether they wanted to or not, uh, how important the global supply chain is and how important uh, the network is uh, and how that works inside the United States. So uh, COVID actually gave us the awareness that we probably couldn't have reached in the next 10 years uh, over the course of two. Yeah. I've joked sometimes, Admiral, to your colleagues that uh, when you drive into a Walmart, and you've got all these containers sitting in the yard, there should be a sticker on them saying, brought to you by the U.S. Navy, <laughs> so that people could <laughs> directly understand the relationship between markets and, and commerce from your vantage point. Well, I, th I think uh, it's really our responsibility to be more effective communicators about how important the ocean is in all of these areas, especially in the non-security side. I, I, mm -hmm. you, know, you do mm -hmm. a wonderful job of convincing uh, federal government that, that our security rests on the Navy as well as, as the other forces. But getting across the, the issues of the economy, not just the, again, the transport economy, but the economy of uh, energy, the economy of uh, resources uh, and the dependence, um, it's no longer, the ocean is no longer optional for policy. And for many years it has been. Uh, there would be, you know, for, I don't know, 20, 22 years, we've had some kind of a policy document on the ocean. But I think that a lot of it has largely been ignored uh, in terms of, uh, of action enabled by, uh, by funds from, uh, from the government. And I don't think it's optional anymore. The ocean isn't optional. And we have to get that message across. Admiral. I, I would just reinforce what, what they both said. Um, uh, Americans uh, expect that that Amazon box arrive at their front door when, the, when, it, when it should arrive. They expect it always to be on time. It isn't until things are interrupted uh, and they cause inconvenience or you, know, or you feel it in your wallet that, that it's actually going to make a difference and really grip the attention of the American, uh, the American public. A, a, train, a, a, a train wreck in Ohio uh, with that hazardous material would be another example. We don't think twice about train travel and the safety of trains in the United States. And so it isn't until a, 
uh, uh, vessel like Ever Given uh, goes sideways in the Suez Canal at the potential cost of, let's say, $10 billion a day. Uh, over time, that will affect people in their pocket, but they don't see that. Piracy, the, 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 the same thing. Until people really see how that's going to affect them on a day-to-day -day basis, they just assume uh, that we're just going to take care of that and things are going to get back to normal very, very quickly. And so um, I, that said... I will say to the points that the others made that the U.S. Congress recognizes the importance of the maritime commons. And, I, and after, from a from military standpoint, after two decades of ground wars, we've seen a significant shift in investments in the Navy and the Coast Guard in the maritime. Um, and so it's, it's overdue, but it's very welcome, and uh, they're very serious and focused on, on that uh, on those investments. It brings me to another question, which is sparked by something Peter said and also came in from, from an online audience, which is around shipbuilding. Uh, do we have enough shipbuilding capacity in this country? Uh, and if not, what can we do about it? I'll start with you and Peter. Uh, the short answer is no, we don't. Um, so when I first joined the Navy, uh, we had about 30 shipbuilders. Now we're down to seven. Um, and I think in the commercial side, it's not much different. Um, back in those days, in the, in the mid-1980s, the U.S. government stopped subsidizing those private shipyards. So you saw a contraction in the number of builders that we have. And again, we are limited by law in terms of where we buy their ships that need to be U.S. made. And so um, we have focused on trying to keep a very predictable, we call them a set of headlights, for the shipbuilding industry to give them stability and predictability over time that that business is going to be there in order to replenish uh, re, 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 or keep the, keep the fleet updated with respect to ships. Right now, uh, across those seven shipyards, we have more than 50 ships in construction and another 70-plus uh, on contract. And so, again, that's been uh, due to the help of the Congress. And so I see that trend moving in a, in a, in a very healthy direction. On the commercial side, and this is not my area of expertise, but uh, I did notice that the Department of Transportation recently made an investment in grants for some 25 or 27 uh, smaller shipyards uh, to keep them viable in this economy. So, Peter? Yeah, it would be great to bring back U.S. shipbuilding in a big way and be able to build these big container ships uh, in the U.S. Uh, Price-wise, it's, it's almost three to four times more expensive to build one of these ships uh, in the United States. That's yeah. just the fact. So China, uh, by far, is, is uh, the most aggressive in being able to provide the, the shipbuilding services. Korea is another one. Um, and it's, it's purely a, a, a cost situation. It's if you're a, we have 600 container ships. So when we build a new ship, you know, we're not going to go to the most expensive place to do it. That's just the, the way it is. Um, even our U.S. you know our U.S. flag fleet, uh, those are U.S. flag under the Marine Security Program, not necessarily U.S. ships, but U.S. flags. So see, uh, U.S. crews uh, and, and that. So it would be great to have it come back. I, I don't think it's possible. And, and let me ask you specifically. I mean, China is obviously a large player here, but so are Korea and Japan who have large shipyards. Yes cheaper than ours, heavily subsidized, but also allies. How much does that factor into your, your equation when you think about acquisition of new ships? Well, that's all we look at. And so th those are the places that we would look at to build new ships. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the complexity of these ships now, too, with the LNG and the methane uh, ships that we're building, um, it's, it's just an area that we don't have here today. I, I would say it's, it's worth examining the market, though, in terms of uh, in terms of military shipbuilding. And so there's an Italian firm that now builds uh, U.S. Navy warships. They have a contract on our new frigate uh, in Wisconsin. And so there may be room there for medium-sized ship, 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 shipyards uh, to build those types of ships in the United States in certain areas of the country where uh, perhaps it's a bit cheaper with respect, to, um, with respect to the skilled labor. But that's a challenge in and of itself is having the, no, having the right, the, yeah, right skill sets and the right numbers. This is Fink I met with him yesterday. It's a super interesting story of an Italian mega multinational That's right. uh, working with a, uh, one of the oldest shipbuilding firms in the United States in Marinette, Wisconsin. Yep. Yep. Uh, fascinating story. Mm -hmm. um, another set of questions that came in online is around research in the uh, underwater space. And Scripps has been a, a leader here for many years. You had the Argo program, one of the first to use um, unmanned, if not fully autonomous vehicles to do climate modeling. You're also 
innovating in unmanned drones. Can you just say a word about that? And then I want to ask you to what I know in your shipbuilding plan that's a big fact. So. Yeah, so many of the, the uh, things that I mentioned before lead us to uh, focus on uh, the ocean below the surface and being able to get access to that, uh, being able to do what we want to do in it uh, are really, uh, really key. And a lot of the focus has been on not so much building the platforms themselves, because we have a lot of great platforms, but developing the capability for those platforms to measure new things, to take samples, analyze them, and send back the data instead of the samples. Uh, It's cheaper. Uh, You can do a lot more of it. And uh, another piece of this is uh, the, the growing call for... Uh, the ocean internet of things, and Admiral uh, Gilday referred to this. Almost all of the focus has been on the things as opposed to the internet piece, and that's because that piece is really hard. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't uh, rely on, on uh, light waves. You have to rely on either fiber optic or something that's connected uh, or or sound, which is the light of the ocean, but there you don't have the bandwidth to send things. So uh, being able to overcome that hurdle and think about being able to measure, to uh, send back data, to transfer data, to have uh, intelligent swarms of instruments that would go out, which we take for granted in the atmosphere, uh, would really be a game changer. And so that getting at that capability for the deep sea uh, is, is one of the lodestars. This was, these sets of issues were central to your updated uh, shipbuilding plan or your, your, your fleet plan. So maybe just say a word about where you think we are in U.S. Navy terms in terms of unmanned, sure. unmanned vessels. Um, people talk about space as the last frontier, but there's so much that we don't know about the oceans and the ocean bottom. Uh, we are shifting to significant resources to unmanned. Uh, so for, for under the sea, uh, some of those are autonomous vehicles that, uh, that are fairly large. Others are launched out of torpedo tubes. Um, but the, the key here in terms of the information that they're able to collect uh, is how to use that data in the best way possible. And so um, while the unmanned platforms themselves are fascinating, the AI element is the real secret sauce. And so AI capabilities are giving us the ability to take a look at that data, uh, to learn more faster, to be, to, to be much more predictable, I think, in terms of uh, how we understand uh, um, uh, ocean currents, um, uh, things going on un- under the seas that maybe we, maybe we didn't understand, or it would take years to figure out crunching data. Uh, and so the reliance on AI, I, AI I think, is fundamentally the biggest game changer with understanding, with getting a better understanding of the undersea. Uh, you've also got programs, mostly out of Fifth Fleet, doing innovation in UUVs. Uh, how, how long is it going to take to bring those on stream in terms of actual deployable capabilities? Uh, so we'll have 100 unmanned by the end of the year in the Middle East, and so they're, they're augmenting our manned ships. Um, uh, we just don't have enough manned ships to cover uh, 70% of the world's surface. And so we're shifting that now uh, to U.S. Fourth Fleet, which operates around South America. And so this July, we'll begin, uh, and our, our largest exercise down there called UNITAS, we'll introduce unmanned uh, to South America and to our South American partners. Let me say this. In, in the Middle East, um, of those 100, uh, 80% of the investment is made by allies and partners, not by the United States. Uh, the unmanned platforms are one piece of it. The data that we're collecting and are leveraging AI to both display and be more predictable in how things are moving is, a, is probably a more important piece of it. In South America, there are a couple of things that we wanted to get after. Um, number one is, uh, uh, is the security of the approaches to the United States. So think, think the Caribbean, think drug flow, think illicit trafficking. The other is illegal fishing off of both coasts of South America, which is a big problem. And so this potentially unmanned gives, gives us, along with allies and partners, which is really key here, the ability to keep an unblinking eye on that kind of activity, collect data, uh, 
And if we want to talk about PRC again, to expose that gray zone activity, that's the most important thing that we can do about that about that malign behavior is to expose it to the world and that it's not consistent with the rules-based order that you know, we've talked about here uh, earlier. And that's, I think, a big program in the Pacific where you've got substantial uh, illegal fishing, you've got major climate issues, and I think there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, Allied Coast Guards, and others uh, in terms of uh, ocean intelligence gathering, essentially. Um, I want to ask one last question for me, and we'll turn to the audience. Um, allies have come up in one way or another throughout this. Central to your presentation of your approach, uh, you've factors in in your shipbuilding and your commerce, sure. et cetera. It's part of your collaboration. Um, but so is China uh, and, you know, there and all of this. How do you think about the boundary between those things? Or are there things you'll do with Korea that you won't do with Japan? Or are there are research projects you would feel uncomfortable having the Russians or the Chinese? Or how do you, how do you think about that boundary? Peter first. Well, it's, it's been interesting uh, post-COVID or even during COVID, we've seen this, this massive this shift of sourcing from China to Southeast Asia, India, Latin America, Mexico. Um, this is a good thing because prior to that, uh, I think importers and retailers woke up during COVID and said, my God, you know, all our sourcing eggs are in one basket. So there's been this de-risking from China. That sourcing is moving to allies, the friend shoring concept. Um, that's also helped in the supply chain in the United States because those areas that the sourcing is shifting lends itself to the Suez Canal and to the U.S. East Coast and Gulf. So instead of aiming everything at L.A. Long Beach, we have a de-risking, we have a, a risk mitigation of U.S. ports, and we have a risk mitigation in sourcing. So whatever crisis comes down the road in the future, I think we'll be much more prepared. Uh, but it's very much around the trust of these of, of these allies and where the sourcing is moving. And that's what we're seeing, uh, and that's what we're supporting. Margaret, how does this work in your world? Well, science is a team sport, and, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, and the ocean is so big that no individual nation can really uh, do the kinds of observations and experiments uh, just on their own that really are game changers. And so we're used to... Um, international campaigns. What what we want is for the U.S. to be the preferred partner uh, in all of that, and in, in the same way that w we think about it in defense, we we want to be the preferred partner for allies, and it's the same for science. And so, you know, there's intense competition for the best idea, or you know, the funds to roll out a new ship or new instruments or capabilities, but in the end, we rely on that distributed knowledge uh, to be able to operate. Any concerns about that? Uh, yes, um, but let me use an example, and that example would be AUKUS, recently signed by three heads of state, U.S., Australia, and the U.K., of course, uh, and when, when people think about that agreement, the first thing that comes to mind uh, are submarines, but there's a whole second pillar of the AUKUS agreement that it has to do with, with the exchange of exquisite technologies in the areas of quantum computing, of AI, unmanned. And so we have really strong security protocols with those countries. But I also think that uh, that is perhaps the framework that we can look to sharing sensitive uh, information more broadly, perhaps, in working with other nations on a, on a case basis. I go back to technology. Zero trust would be an example of those types of um, firewalls, if you will, that you could put in place to help uh, to help maintain yeah. a sense of security. But there are good companies out there all all, all over the all over the world, and we can carefully, uh, I think, pick and choose who we work with and to what level, and do it in an informed way, uh, in an unemotional way. Uh, to benefit um, ourselves and, 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 uh, and allies and partners. I've definitely seen an uptick in sort of discussion in Asia in particular about uh, Pillar 2 of AUKUS. And mm -hmm. one of the questions that came in from line from a Japanese lawmaker about the possibility of expanding mm -hmm. cooperation mm -hmm. uh, with AUKUS 2. Let me open the floor to our audience. I'll take two or three questions, if you don't mind, and you can kind of pick and choose what you want to answer. We'll do a couple of rounds. So mm -hmm. we're going to do this side of the room first, and then we'll have a second round. So starting right up front.
Thank you. Uh, John Harper with Defense Scoop. Uh, my question is for Admiral Gilday. Admiral, can you give us an update on where things stand with Project Overmatch and what's going on with the Carl Vinson? And then kind of looking ahead, how do you envision rolling out those capabilities to the rest of the force? Are you going to do it fleet by fleet, or what's kind of the path ahead on that? So um, for the audience that may not be familiar with Overmatch, um, what we wanted to try and do with this project is to be able to take any data, containerize it, and send it over any network. So instead of building a whole new, whole new uh, um, uh, operational infrastructure, is to basically leverage what we have, primarily uh, leveraging commercial technology, right, and just pivoting, um, pivoting it to a to a to a military use. So think about think about the fact if you're watching a YouTube video. And then you walk outside these doors. You're going to your phone, uh, your your smart, your your handheld is going to instantly switch from Wi-Fi to whatever carrier that provides your service. And so it's the same type of thinking where it's actually software, software control, software defined in terms of prioritizing what data is most important and where it ends up and by what path. Um, so uh, we've had great success in leveraging some great technologies from industry. And uh, we've, we're now experimenting with a carrier strike group. So think about aid ships um, uh, across many different networks and many different types of data. Uh, I think that we'll likely uh, focus on the Pacific first and then, uh, and then expand um, uh, globally uh, into in, in our other fleets. We are also working closely with some key allies and partners uh, with respect to this. Uh, most notably, I think, would be the Australians, the French, and the, Br French and the Brits. Uh, and and I, I think that that will ex I think that that will expand over time. It's going it's going well, um, but we still have more work to do. We're learning every day. Yes, in the Pacific. Uh, and again, it's a it's a DevOps kind of environment. So we're learning as we're doing. I'm going to take if you don't mind. I'm going to take two or three questions, and then you can sort of pick which ones you want to refer to. So the gentleman with his hand up there, and then uh, these two on this side, and then we'll. Hi, uh, my name is Andre Gunawala. I'm associated with the Burn Bag podcast. And uh, my question is on naval supply chains and securing those. So it seems that we operate on a containerized economy. And those containers will often require land-based ports for physical unpacking, physical staging, etc. What happens if we lose access to the ports in the event of conflict? For example, Guam, a forward distribution site, a material processing center, what happens if we lose access to the ports and their warehousing functions? What do we do to secure the naval supply lines? Thank you. Can I open it up and then, and then pitch it your way? Uh, do you mind if we just take another couple of questions sure. and then we'll do yeah. that? So, Okay. Just up here in the center. Mm -hmm. no. um, Caitlin Kenny with Defense One. Um, in light of the recent interaction between the U.S. ship and the Chinese ship in the Taiwan Strait, and the stall communication between our military leaders, are you seeing maybe a new phase of competition with China that could see dangerous interactions increase? And is the Navy working on any new procedures or policies on how to operate in that area to remain safe but not reduce our presence? Take one more question and then come back to Admiral and to, to you if you want to come in. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Jesse Le Pen at State Department. And I actually just wanted to, to really offer to throw into the mix <clears throat> that at State, with colleagues from the Navy and across USG, we're building out a new initiative for Atlantic cooperation, yeah. and that's Pan-Atlantic. So all the discussion about partners and allies has been very Global North-focused. Mm -hmm. um, that's traditionally where we've operated, but as we think of a, a single ocean, um, the inclusion of partners in the Global South, in Africa, in Latin America is really important. So we are taking that forward and thinking in sort of the sectors that have been outlined in terms of security, environment, and economy. Thanks. Right, thank you very much. Admiral. I, to, so to the last point, I, I think that's the way we are looking at it, um, more expansively, more inclusive. I think that's competitive space for those that want to follow the rules-based order and those that, that, may, that may be challenging it. And so that is uh, space that we can't ignore or ignore uh, to our detriment. Um, to the question about our, you know, how we operate out there with respect to the PRC. We are operating uh, in accordance with international law under, on, and above the sea um, so that others can too. And so we are trying to operate very responsibly. Um, and again, to keep things, we, we, we are not looking to be provocative. 
We want things to remain stable and predictable. That's our job out there uh, during peacetime. Uh, and to deter anybody from doing anything malign as best we can. And if they do something malign, to expose it, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to the gray space. In terms of, um, you, made, you made a point about Guam. I mean, this gets to just putting all your eggs in one basket, right? And I think uh, we're looking at a d more diverse set of allies and partners. Where can we operate out? It's not just bases. It's also places that you have to, that you have to think about. And they don't necessarily need to have a U.S. flag there. Um, uh, we can't afford that, and that's not really what we desire. I think it's, I think it's leveraging those partnerships uh, in a more wholesome way uh, to be able to operate together, to be able to leverage those ports more effectively. I also think that there's um, that there's another that there's another um, uh, uh, piece here with respect to unmanned, um, where we can more effectively leverage unmanned and kind of a lead follow um, uh, framework where you might have a manned ship uh, with, a, with a bunch of unmanned that, that travel with it that allow you to, to move stuff quicker and more effectively uh, in, in a more distributed way in areas like the Pacific. Other you want Thanks. to come in on? Was well, just on or Guam, or? it's an interesting question because Guam just had the typhoon, so we had to go to Plan B. That's a lot of what we do with the U.S. Yeah. flag yeah. on the military side. Uh, the nice thing about container shipping is it's, it's extremely flexible. So there's 700 ports around the world. We can be wherever Transcom needs us to be uh, and, and have those contingency plans ready to go uh, and just sail there. So uh, one place goes down, we can open another place or move to another place fairly quickly. Margaret, thoughts on these? Uh, well, I think that, that uh, what, what, you're, what you're hearing in, in terms of the, the flexibility and in terms of, of a wide variety of players and, and mm -hmm. allies uh, holds true on the science side as well. And uh, we, you know, we, there, we're intensely competitive, but we're intensely oriented toward partnerships. And uh, that's what keeps everybody uh, at the top of their game. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of quick questions from this side of the room, and then we'll we'll wrap up as we run, begin to run our time. Gentleman here. Uh, hi, I'm Ethan Chu, uh, part of the Coalition Defense of Taiwan Project at AEI. Um, so, given inf insufficient U.S. shipbuilding capability right now, with Battle Force ships even projected to decrease in FY24, there's been some calls to. Uh, change the law to offshore some naval shipbuilding contracts to Japan and South Korea. Do you think that would be effective or even tenable, um, at least in the short term? Yeah, so I would say that, that that's really a political issue that uh, right now is um, uh, uh, constrained by, by law. And so my focus is just trying to feel the you know, most lethal, capable, ready force that I can every day, given the resources that I have. Uh, and if other opportunities open up, I would definitely wouldn't wouldn't turn my head to them. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got to deal with what we have. Let me ask you: in terms of opportunities, a country that hasn't come up, which it strikes me as having sort of enormous potential in this space, but not yet realized, perhaps, is India. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, from each of your vantage points, where India fits into your perspective, commercially, scientifically, strategically. Mm -hmm. Here. Commercially, it's, it's a big part of our strategy going forward. If you look at what India is doing infrastructure-wise now, uh, it looks very much like China 25 years ago. Uh, imports from India are up 45% already. So uh, I think India is going to be the place uh, in the next... Does that include ports infrastructure? Port infrastructure in India, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, India always had the problems of not being able to connect the road from one, one place to the other. Uh, it's, it's really moving uh, at, at light speed now with the investment, and I think what Modi's doing there around infrastructure, it's, it's real. Um, the quality of manufacturing has, has significantly increased, um, and I just think India is going to be a, a big player going forward. In the oceanographic sciences, we've seen Brazil, Turkey, China, Korea, Australia, the Europeans. Have we seen anything like that growth in the oceanographic sciences in India? Certainly. And uh, the uh, investment in oceanography has been growing very quickly. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we work very closely with India on the observations that are allowing much better predictability of the monsoons. 
Uh, another piece is um, uh, everything related to um, sustainability. So it's one of the countries that has uh, great dependence on seafood protein, and so they're very interested in all of the issues around the sustainability of those fisheries and everything that they're based on, the, the entire food chain. So we've worked very closely with them on that as well. From your vantage point, the Quad and related. Yeah, very bullish in the relationship with India. So you mentioned the Quad, uh, the Malabar exercise, which is only growing in importance, our day-to-day -day operations in the Indian Ocean with the Indian Navy, um, out of their airfields as well. Um, I would also uh, uh, mention the fact that they, in the past year, they've joined the uh, Combined Maritime Force in Bahrain at U.S. Yeah. Fifth Fleet. So they joined the 35 other nations that we have operating uh, together. I have a very close relationship with my counterpart. We just started doing maintenance of some of our ships in, in Indian ports. So there's a lot of examples of that relationship heading in the right direction. I would also say that it's been uh, helped, I think, uh, perhaps unfortunately by the by the by the the uh, friction on the border between China and India, uh, and now India, I mean now China, instead of just uh, looking east to the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea, must also look over their shoulder in India. Yeah. And so I think that that, in some regards, is helpful for us in terms of strengthening that relationship and their resolve. I have a feeling that both from commercial, scientific, and strategic terms, we're going to spend a lot of time hearing about the Andaman Sea and uh, <laughs> right. issues on that side of the Swiss, right? Mm -hmm. um, ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap, I'd like you to do me a favor. Um, we're going to ask you to remain seated as I escort our guests off stage. While we do that, we're going to play a short video that just introduces this series that we're investing in on the season strategy. But before we do all that, please join me in thanking our terrific guests for spending some time with us today. Thank you. The world's oceans have emerged as a central battleground in the mounting competition between the world's top powers. 85% of all global trade moves by sea. It's how most of us get our crucial goods and sustain our ways of life. In a matter of a few short decades, China has far outstripped every other country as a source for sea-based trade. Shanghai, the world's largest trading hub, moved 42 million shipping containers last year, almost six times more than its largest American competitor. The Singapore Strait has displaced the Suez Canal as the world's most important shipping lane. It's not just commercial trade that relies on the oceans. Almost three quarters of the world's supply of oil and gas is found at sea or moved by sea to its final market. Data, too. Fully 93% of the data that powers the internet, social media, and global finance moves through undersea cables that line the ocean floor. American internationalism was born at sea, and U.S. naval dominance has long been a crucial feature of American power and leadership. Along with being critically important for trade and energy, Oceans are also a literal weather vane of our changing climate and the locale of some of the most important climate science. There's a great deal to gain and a lot to lose on the world's oceans. For now, the U.S. has the only Navy capable of projecting power across the high seas. But China is moving swiftly to compete, and in some domains, like anti-ship missile technology, it has outpaced America. Russia has revived some parts of its naval might. Japan is unshackling its powerful Navy. India is positioning itself to compete, and Britain is trying to restore some of its former reach. All of this amounts to an ongoing global naval arms race, pitting the world's top military and economic powers in a tense rivalry. Over the past two years, the world has witnessed several events that highlight the high stakes at sea. When the massive Ever Given ran aground in the Suez Canal, publics worldwide were awed by images of hundreds of container ships and tankers lined up waiting to get through that still vital choke point. Congestion at the port of Long Beach led to long wait times for container ships to offload their cargo, causing costly delays that Americans felt in their pocketbooks. An explosion that disrupted the Nord Stream natural gas pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany was a jarring reminder of the vital and vulnerable undersea infrastructure on which most major economies rely. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent fighting in and around the Black Sea disrupted the supply of grain and fertilizer to global food markets threatening the lives and livelihoods of tens of millions of people worldwide. These events happen in the foreground, while in the background, tensions about access and ownership are mounting in the icy Arctic high north, in the warm waters off Latin America, and along East Asia's many coasts, while submarines emerge as the front line of a mounting arms race between the world's major military powers. 
while technology reveals more and more about the natural resources in the ocean's vast depths and as science continues to remind us of the profoundly important role the oceans play in stabilizing our climate. Join us at Brookings as our new series, The Seas and Strategy, engages officials, operators, explorers, and scientists in conversation and debate about the changing dynamics and crucial stakes of competition, cooperation, and conflict on and under the world's seas. The world's ocean.